Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I too also want to lend my support to this initiative. There is a hardship that, and a heavy burden, Mr. Speaker, that's placed, especially the persons that are most vulnerable in our society. The uncertainty of knowing where the next paycheck is going to come from. And I'm sure that they're going to welcome this initiative. Well, Mr. Speaker, in listening to the member from Castries East, the Prime Minister, speak about why he did this. And in his true compassionate way, spoke about the suffering that they had. He spoke about his own father and your father, who depended on pensions. And I can understand that sense of urgency, but I would have imagined at his age that he knew about his father's situation and your father's situation for a long time. And so the question I have to ask, Mr. Speaker, is this a genuine effort on this government's part to have to have come to the House today to make this amendment? Or is it as a result of the cries in the street, as a result of the promises that they did not make? And I speak for a few, Mr. Speaker. As a member, the Prime Minister made mention of the promises and that this was a promise that he made in his manifesto, Mr. Speaker. So I want to ask a question. Did the Labour Party promise to keep gas and cooking gas prices high? Was that a promise that they made in their manifesto, Mr. Speaker? Because that's exactly what we've seen, that despite the fact that world prices for cooking gas and world prices for gas have come down, that this government has maintained a policy of high prices. And Mr. Speaker, it's laughable when you see the justification that a press statement will be put out, Mr. Speaker, talking about the, the quantum of the subsidy for cooking gas, as if they are the only government that ever used to subsidize cooking gas. We have been subsidizing cooking gas based on the extra excise tax that we've made off of gas. For years, for decades, Mr. Speaker, for decades. So the fact is, is if in fact that this was genuinely a caring government, a, co a government that, I'm not even going to repeat their motto, because it's become a joke in St. Lucia. Did they promise to increase the price of food? I don't remember reading in the manifesto that this government was going to introduce a health and security levy of 2.5%. I don't know if you did, Mr. Speaker. I certainly didn't read, read it anywhere that this government was going to come in and increase the price of food. Did I see that manifesto? Did this government, in their manifesto, promise to increase the price of bread? One dollar used to be able to buy four loaves of bread. Today, it's only two. Two, Mr. Speaker. So the pressure that we're feeling on the ground or they're feeling on the ground to have come today to make this amendment is not coming from a place of caring. It's coming from a place of crying. That's where it's coming from, Mr. Speaker. Did this government in its manifesto promise the people of St. Lucia to increase bus fares? I tried to remember. Did they make that promise, Mr. Speaker? Because that's exactly what they did. So are they keeping the promise? But you see, Mr. Speaker, I get there. Did this government, when it was coming to government and its manifesto, promise to increase the debt of this country to the extent that they have? Mr. Speaker, we're in a situation today, Mr. Speaker where government revenues today have exceeded the revenues that we had in 2019 before COVID. And we all know that what happened during COVID in the first year that government revenues dropped by over 40%.
and a member from Choiselle spoke about some of the initiatives that we did with those reduced revenues. Today, this government is seeing a bonanza, a flurry, a substantial, a, a halcyon days of revenue. And, we, and they borrowed, Mr. Speaker, more money this year than the government borrowed in 2020. I want that to sink in. That with increased revenues exceeding the level that we had before the COVID, that this government, this last year, borrowed more money than we borrowed during the COVID. And it's only today you want to come and say that you care for the pensioners. I'm happy that you're doing it, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy. What I'm questioning, what I'm questioning is why now? Mr. Speaker, did they, did, they, did they promise, Mr. Speaker, to destroy the banana sector? Did they promise to destroy the banana sector? Did they say that we were going to terminate the banana sector? Did they say that we're going to stop exporting bananas to England, Mr. Speaker? Was that a campaign promise, Mr. Speaker? Because that's exactly what they have done. Was that one of the promises they made, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, did they promise to move the vendors? Did they? Did they promise to tell the vendors that we don't owe you anything? Even if you've been there for 20 years, we don't owe you anything. Was that a promise? Was that a promise, Mr. Speaker? That this, that this government made, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I look around and I see secrets. I see lies. And I see propaganda. All for what, Mr. Speaker? And that's what this is ultimately about, you know, Mr. Speaker. All this is about is about protecting the victory. And Mr. Speaker, the country's assets are being plundered right before our very eyes because of these secrets these lies and this propaganda. That is what is happening, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to know, declaring war against corruption, declaring war against crime in this country, Mr. Speaker, what does that have to do with when you say to the people of St. Lucia, there shall be no rest in the streets? Which one is the real threat? Which one is the real patriot? of this country. Mr. Speaker, everywhere you look around and you listen to what this government has had to say, it's lacking. Mr. Speaker, when we came into government, Mr. Speaker, one of the first initiatives that we said we would do was lower the VAT rate. And we did. We said that we were going to lower the unemployment rate. We took it from 25% to 16%, Mr. Speaker. We said that we are going to help the South. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the fact that we created more jobs in that term than in the history of any other administration in government, Mr. Speaker. Ojo Labs, 400 people. ITEL BPO, another six, 700 people. Mr. Speaker, do you know that the salaries of ITEL BPO and Ojo Labs collectively together was $40 million a year, Mr. Speaker? $40 million in salary that was being pumped into the South, Mr. Speaker. The initiative building an international hospital, and people got to see it. Instead, what do we have today, Mr. Speaker? We have another secret. Nobody knows what's really going on at St. Jude's. Shrouded in secrecy. And this government now is going to want to come and tell us in this budget, Mr. Speaker, that they're going to spend $265 million, Mr. Speaker. On what exactly, Mr. Speaker? The member from Castry Central got it right. What are you going to spend $265 million on? On what? And three years has gone by, and nothing has changed other than the fact that there is a secret contract taking place and a secret amount of money that is being done. And all we hear is lies and propaganda, Mr. Speaker. That's all we see. Secret lies and propaganda. That's all we're getting, Mr. Speaker, to explain every single thing that's taking place in this country. Because this is a government that in opposition said anything it had to say to get into government. But when it gets into government, 
it's a different story. It's a different story, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I welcome this initiative. But this initiative is only an attempt to try to make up for what they've already taken from the people of St. Lucia. That's what is happening, Mr. Speaker. And I'm hoping, Mr. Speaker, that we're going to see the price of gas come down below $15 a gallon, Mr. Speaker. I'm hoping that we're going to see that the, gas, the price of cooking gas will come back down to $22, Mr. Speaker. I don't know, Mr. Speaker, how they're going to reverse the bus, the bus fares, because once you've given it, I don't know how you're going to take it back. I don't know how you're going to convince the, the, the bakers of this country, Mr. Speaker, to bring back the price of bread to where it was before. And that's why we said that by not subsidizing those things initially, the world economy would have recovered, Mr. Speaker, but we now are being left with these, this, this history this, this of, of price gouging that's taken place, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is tax gouging, my apologies. Tax gouging. Because when you don't allow the price of cooking gas to have decreased more, when you don't allow the price of gas at the pump to go down, when you continue to allow the price of electricity to be sold at a higher price, all those things, Mr. Speaker, result in taxes. Increase in taxes. And we see it, Mr. Speaker. We saw it in the budget. It wasn't hidden. We saw in the budget, the budget Mr. Speaker, that the increase, the increase in revenue came from two sources. It came from the excise tax, which was the, cook, the, uh, the increase amount of money that they had budgeted for the gas prices. And because they had not lowered the cooking gas tax down sufficiently, they, made, they had to subsidize it substantially less than what they projected, which means that they earned more money. And the second area that they made money, Mr. Speaker, was in CIP. And that's for another show. That's for another show. This government has not increased the performance of this country. Mr. Speaker, when we see $80 million going into the NLA, we knew that we were going to be doing World Cup cricket. And you still could not get the stadium done right? You were still working? Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker? Anybody who is willing to throw any amount of money can get the stadium looking nice. Does the sign Darren Sammy look beautiful? It looks great. The grass looks great. All the paint that's there, it looks fantastic. But I want to know, Mr. Speaker, because the contractors that were put on the job, because they could not have finished the job themselves, and two major contractors had to be mobilized, what was the cost to do that? When a contractor has to go and take equipment off of other jobs to bring it up there, it comes at a price. Why? Why? It's a beautiful stadium. It's always been a beautiful stadium. And I congratulate you because the Labour Party started it. And that's great. Okay? Yes, you built it. Built it. No problem. I have no problems in saying that. Okay? But at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, end of the day, Mr. Speaker, it is about how you use scarce resources. And in particular, Mr. Speaker, when you want to come to the House and speak about the vulnerable, and you want to start crying about the plight of the people on the ground, but meanwhile, you are mismanaging scarce resources of this country, Mr. Speaker. Everywhere I turn around, Mr. Speaker, whether it's NLA, whether it's GPH, whether it's Banan's Land, whether it's CIP, wherever I turn around, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker it has gotten to the point I have to ask the question, Mr. Speaker. I have to ask the question, Mr. Speaker. WTF? WTF, Mr. Speaker? Really? WTF, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Central. Mr. Speaker, I have tremendous, on a point of order, Mr. Speaker, you have often chastised, castigated members for using unparliamentary language in this august chamber. Not too long ago, those, that acronym was used in the parliament in Canada. That same WTF, and the speaker asked the member 
to withdraw this WTF. We all know what it means, Mr. Speaker. And if we permit the member to go down that road, he has disrespected this House time and time and time again. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, I am asking you to construe whatever the member said has been unparliamentary and ask him to withdraw this WTF. Member for Castle Central, if you're going to relay an incident, you must relay the entire incident. After the, after the call by the speaker to withdraw, the member explained WTF was where are the funds? Where's the funds? So, but I cannot interpret what the member from Miku meant by WTF when WTF has more than one meaning. Mr. Speaker, I have absolutely no choice but to respect your ruling in this matter. But I am afraid, Mr. Speaker, that the gates, the floodgates rather, will now be open and persons will use acronyms. One sec, Mr. Speaker, if you permit me. Persons will use acronyms and conveniently and in a, in, in a manner that lends itself to non-contention can say, well, WTF means where are the funds? Some other acronym means something else when we know in our local palace that's not the true interpretation. Remember, it is difficult for any presiding officer to constrain a member when the acronym has more than one meaning. And in the context which the member, but remember, we also have to look at the context. The member for Miku South was speaking in finance. So, I can't interpret WTF in the colloquial way that you are suggesting. Please proceed, Member Famico. Member Famico South, please proceed. Mr. Speaker, in typical fashion, the member from Castries East, is, sorry, Castries Central, is always in a haste and always just wants to tell half the story. That's why I said, Mr. Speaker, that he deserves to get a PhD. Yes, I know, PhD, a PhD in psychology, Mr. Speaker. And, it, and that's exactly what it means, and I'm glad he knew the story. Where's the funds? Every time we turn around in this country, all we hear is a secret deal, we hear lies and propaganda, but more importantly, we are left asking ourselves the question, where's the funds? And I'm sure the, pension, the pensioners themselves, Mr. Speaker, are going to be asking the same question. Is this, and I hope it's not, an example of too little, too late. So what the government has to do is both things, Mr. Speaker. They needed to increase the pension as they have, and I applaud them for it. But the second thing is, is to prevent the impact, to reduce the impact of inflation on their lives. And if you genuinely know and believe that you can empathize with those people, and you believe you can do it better than anybody else, because you have all these great examples, which makes it worse, because you all know better. You all proclaim to know better. And the persons that should be defending and not allowing the 2.5% levy to have gone in, who should not have allowed bus fares to have gone up, who should not have allowed the price of bread to go up, who should not be allowing the cost of living to take place in the extent of this country, that's when they should have fought for these things, Mr. Speaker. But don't come after the fact and people are suffering and believe that you're bringing a gift. You're not. You're not. You're not. And again, no, no, Mr. Speaker. Every day when, they, when, they are, when they're held accountable, the persons that are holding them accountable are unpatriotic and somehow don't care about solution. Well, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, I have news for you. Holding you accountable and calling you out has nothing to do with my patriotism or the patriotism United Workers' Party has for this country and for the people of St. Lucia. And the, and the answers to the questions that we're putting forward are not more, not more questions. Questions that have already been answered and you know that they've been answered. Instead, it is to be accountable. You are in government. Your job is to provide the detailed answers to the people of this country. And while I applaud this, Mr. Speaker, this is a great initiative. I'm happy for the people, at the, at, at the more vulnerable people, but it's not enough. And you all need to look in a mirror and wake up 
and start understanding that this country is going backwards. And as much as you may want to deny it, as much as you may not want to appreciate the suffering that's taking place in this country, you need to go and understand that that's taking place. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would not even pretend if I was in government to have a march of shame. Right? Who has ever heard of a government marching against themselves? So what are you going to do? It has to be a march of shame. That's only what a government does. That's what a government does. Okay, Mr. Speaker, not while I was in government. I didn't have a march while I was in government. You're in government and you're going to march against yourselves? Mr. Speaker, I welcome that opportunity, but be, a, be aware if you don't know, and I know you do know, that the people in this country are suffering. People in this country are seeing through the secrets. They're seeing through the lies and the propaganda. And it's not going to continue working, Mr. Speaker. Thank you.